know, Mitch. They love their Coopers. Mitch Harper. Welcome on in to the Cougar Tracks podcast powered by kslsports.com. I'm your BYU insider, Mitch Harper, coming to you from Omaha, Nebraska, just across the street from Charles Schwab Field. I'm looking at it right now through my hotel window. The road to Omaha. It's not the College World Series that I'm here for. I'm here for the March Madness, BYU basketball, getting ready for the NCAA tournament as they take on the Duquesne Dukes on Thursday morning, 10.40 a.m. tip on KSL News Radio. Only 102.7 FM and 1160 a.m. No online streaming for the game. And, of course, it's on True TV as well. This is my preview prediction for the matchup. And this is an intriguing draw for BYU. Look, all the craziness surrounding BYU's seed and where they ended up, it it was kind of a storyline, and rightfully so. If for anyone that's followed BYU basketball for a long time, it was nothing new. It's always fascinating to me when the NCAA tournament comes around or in any sport for BYU, and they end up with an unusual seed or a difficult draw, and it kind of comes out that no Sunday play becomes a a real factor into what caused that, and then it garners headlines, and people get so stunned by it, and it's like, this this is a common occurrence. As I laid out on my story on kslsports.com, this is nothing new for BYU. Oh, you're going to get a, a rematch against Oregon, a team you played in the regular season. Why? Because no Sunday play. You're going to get a rematch back-to-back years with Texas A&M. No Sunday play. Made it difficult. You had to get that team. It's just kind of what it is for BYU, but for people that don't follow the Cougars or don't or don't know the nuances of BYU's no Sunday play, it always kind of blows their mind when they see, oh, that's the 17th overall team, yet they're a sixth seed. How does that happen? Nonetheless, BYU's moved on, and they're here in Omaha as well, getting ready to face the Dukes. And, you know, I think it worked out for BYU. I think this is a favorable matchup. You know, typically when you see BYU in the NCAA tournament, it's, Line up the blue blood, and you're going to be getting some brand that maybe is intimidating on the front of the jersey. Duquesne doesn't bring that to the table. BYU is the bigger brand in this matchup, but as we all know, it's going to come down to executing and playing at a high level because anything can happen in these March Madness games. And I think BYU, though, is in a good spot to to win this game. Now, how far will they go? We'll, we'll get to that a little bit later, but... Duquesne is a team, as I've kind of dove into them a little bit more, watched a a few games, some highlights of their players to kind of get a sense of Duquesne basketball because I'll admit I'm not watching A-10 basketball much. That's one league that I've just never been drawn to in my life, maybe. You know, if I'm not watching the Power Six conferences, I'm watching Mountain West, WCC, Western-based programs. I'm not diving deep into the Duquesne Dukes, just full transparency. So I kind of had to do a deep dive into them. I've heard the name, you know, I've heard the program, but haven't watched much on them until this week. And defensively, they get after it. And this matchup kind of reminds me of, you know, the classic West versus East. You know, out West, you typically have programs and all of college sports where they're a little bit more wide open. West Coast offenses, high-powered offensive attacks. And then on the East, tough, hard nose defensive-minded team. That's that's kind of what this is. You know, BYU is a lot more physical than people give them credit for, and they've been a very good defensive team, honestly. There's just been these games for BYU where they have these lapses. But Duquesne, pretty consistent on the defensive end. Top 35 defense in Ken Palm. Number 46 in turnover rate. So they, kind of like a UCF, how they'll speed you up a little bit and they'll cause you to create some turnovers. They held teams to 48% effective field goal percentage this season. They only allow 66 points per game. That's 28th nationally in college basketball. And, of course, BYU's got one of the highest-powered offenses in the entire sport. But on the flip side with Duquesne, offensively, they're kind of a mess. And in the A-10, they haven't been that great. They're 256 nationally in scoring offense, 70.8 points per game, the Dukes are. The offense is dead last in the A-10 and adjusted efficiency metrics, 14th in that conference. 
They do come into the tournament, however, with the fifth longest win streak of eight games. So they're coming in hot, and they won the A-10 title. This was not a team that was on the radar of getting a bid. Uh, They had to win their conference tournament, and they did that. They beat some good teams in the process. They beat VCU, and they only shot 28% from two, 32% from three. They only had one player score double figures, Day-Day Grant, their top player. He scored 10 points, and they won a conference tournament title. They're 2-3 and in quad one games this year. Their wins at VCU in the regular season, and then they took down Dayton in the A-10 tournament quarterfinals. Three wins over NCAA tournament teams this year. Charleston, the aforementioned Dayton, and St. Peter's. The Peacocks, you got to let them fly. They're a 15 seed again in the tournament. Duquesne's held their opponents to less than 60 points in five of their last seven games. Starting center Trey Williams continues to be out with a shoulder injury. That was announced by their head coach that he's not expected to be playing. Their starting five consists of the following. Jimmy Clark, point guard. Day-Day Grant, shooting guard. Jake DeMichel, small forward. Fusine Drame, power forward, who was once, I mentioned St. Peter's, he was on that St. Peter's team the Elite Eight squad that he came off the bench in a little bit as a reserve role. And then Dusan Mahoricic, if you remember that name, if you're into BYU basketball recruiting, he was someone that was considering BYU uh, coming out of Illinois State. He's a well-traveled D1 player. I believe he's on his fourth school in four years, Dusan Mahoricic is. But he considered BYU. He ended up at Utah. He only lasted a year with the Utes, and he transferred over to Duquesne. But he was a big man that BYU pursued, and he's going to replace Trey Williams in the post. So, again, there's nothing glamorous about this matchup or this team, rather. I I think Duquesne, if you were playing this team in December in the Marriott Center or even on the road, you'd be like, it's not that big of a a threat, really. Like, this is a game where BYU should win. You just kind of wonder... How will BYU's offense fare against a, you know, a physical defense? You know, BYU's face the physicality, though. That's what's so interesting to me about coming into this NCAA tournament is how BYU looks and feels. If Do they act loose? Because they've seen it all in the Big 12. You know, say what you will about the Big 12 conference. I felt the league was underrated by the selection committee personally. I don't think they were valued as the nation's best conference, in my opinion. I thought they were under in many aspects, I believe. But the conference has a lot of different styles, a lot of different body types. The, the personnel's good. The coaching's outstanding in the Big 12. So they've seen it all, BYU has. And they played a, a better non-conference than I think people give them credit for. You know, of course, the Big 12 game, the system, yet... BYU beat the ACC tournament champion, who was the league making the biggest claims about gaming the system. And that seemed to work for the ACC as they got five bids in, five bids in oddly enough. But BYU's seen it all. So this tough, physical Duquesne defense, well, they played Houston, BYU has. They played Iowa State, the two best defenses in college basketball. So this is not going to be anything earth-shattering to BYU. It's about doing what you do at the highest levels. And the good thing about BYU coming into this tournament, they have an identity. You know what they are. The only problem with BYU is that there's a wide variance of outcomes with this group. The floor of BYU is much higher than I think people want to give them credit for at times. How high is the ceiling, though? Is this a team that can make a run and get to the Sweet 16? I think some of the keys for BYU in this matchup as we kind of dive into BYU-Duquesne tip-off, 10.40 a.m. Thursday morning over at Creighton's basketball arena, which, by the way, Creighton has incredible facilities. Again, I'm across the street from Charles Schwab Field. Creighton baseball is playing a game right now as we speak against South Dakota State. And I'm thinking... They're playing in that baseball stadium. I know it's known for the College World Series, but that's an incredible venue. And then the basketball arena, Chai Health Center. Hope I'm saying that right. Outstanding facility. Looking on the outside. I'll be in the building tomorrow morning for the practice and press conference. But I'm like, man, Creighton. 
when you don't have a football program to worry about, you can just funnel the money into everything else, and that's what they're doing out here. But the keys to victory for BYU Thursday morning against Duquesne. You've got to take care of the basketball. Don't let Duquesne speed you up and create those turnovers. I think six turnovers or less, and I think that's doable for BYU. They've had games this season against good competition where they do not turn over the ball that much. Uh, so guys like Ali Khalifa, Dallin Hall, got to take care of the rock. Trevin Nell as well. You've got to secure that basketball with everything you've got and do not let Duquesne create those turnovers. Also got to avoid the the costly mistakes, you know, stepping out of bounds, the offensive fouls, things like that that maybe aren't inflicted by the opponent. But sometimes when you're a favorite in March Madness, those things happen and it can give an underdog a little bit of life. So you got to avoid the turnovers. Set the tone for the tempo of the game. Get out and transition. Duquesne wants to slow it down. They want to muck it up. They want to play a defensive slugfest. Don't let them do that. Set the tone early and get out in transition. That's what BYU wants to be, a thrust team. They want to get out in transition, execute that in this game. And I think along those same lines, start the game strong. If you can replicate what you did against UCF in the Big 12 tournament, you're going to win this ballgame. Don't give the underdog hope after those first 10 minutes of play. I feel like the first 10 minutes of this game are critical because you. I just feel like that's going to be a real tone setter because Duquesne, you always get a little bit leery of teams that are riding high after an incredible conference tournament run. Duquesne didn't have to go four consecutive days to win their tournament. They went four, day, four games in five days, so they did have a little bit of a breather in their conference tournament. But still, it can take a lot out of you. And yes, you can maybe capture lightning in a bottle and maybe extend it for one game. But, uh, you know, if BYU can jump on them early, I think they can knock them out and, and maybe cruise in the second half. So it's critical to get off to a good start. And that's, and that's a storyline for BYU because st- starts have been an issue for this team. I know there's been conversations about should BYU make a lineup change? I don't think they should, personally. You're 16-4 and four with a starting lineup of Dallin Hall, Spencer Johnson, Trevin Nell, Noah Waterman, and Ali Khalifa. That's been your best starting lineup this year. They, they tinkered with Jackson Robinson being in the starting five. It didn't work. It was okay, but it wasn't great. It wasn't anything spectacular. Jackson Robinson clearly has been better this year coming off the bench. Now, if he's off the bench after that first media timeout and then he starts rolling, you leave him in if you're Mark Pope. You don't, you know, toy with it and say you're in and out. Like, no. If he's got a hot hand, you ride with him. At the same time, if things go sideways in that first 90 seconds, two minutes, you make a quick change. You don't wait to the first media timeout. You get that substitution in right away because every second matters in a March Madness game. Again, Duquesne's not a sexy name. You can go to sleep thinking like, oh, they're just going to win it. No. You got to assume that these games are just going to be the ultimate 40-minute slugfest. It's going to go down to the wire. Like, that's just what March Madness creates. Now, again, if BYU plays how they should, that shouldn't be the case. But at this moment, going in, you got to just think this is going to be an all-out battle for 40 minutes to get that win. Because round of 64 victories are hard to come by for BYU. You never take them for granted. I I don't care if it's Duquesne, Wofford, whoever it is. You win in the round of 64, that is a big deal. It's a big deal for any program. BYU is not some blue blood that can just say, oh, that don't matter. We'll, We'll wake up when it's the second weekend. Like, no. You get to the round of 32, that's a big deal. You haven't done that since 2011. So you got to take you got to take this thing as serious as possible, and I think this BYU team is ready to bounce back. They have. That's one of the calling cards of this group, especially in February. You know, the last four games that they lost, the following game they bounce back with a win. They don't let these losses snowball into a second or third loss. That hasn't happened. That's been one of the positive things, and why BYU earned that. Uh, fifth place finish in the Big 12 Conference in their inaugural season. So the look at make it a fifth consecutive 
game where they bounce back immediately after a loss. I think another thing, too, is, you know, BYU's got to get downhill and execute the, the cuts, the backdoor cuts, the passing that define this team. I think that's that ties into the fast start. Uh, but, you know, execute what you know best and clean up on the glass. Against Texas Tech, an undersized Texas Tech team, BYU was a step slow, and the second chance opportunities let the Red Raiders pull away from BYU to an insurmountable lead that you couldn't come back from. They got it down to seven, but we all know that they were never getting back in it. So you got to take care of business on the glass. And I think BYU should. Again, I think BYU matches up well. I don't think the athleticism of Duquesne is is earth-shattering. Shattering. They, they got a good guard line. Uh, they, and guard play can can lift you to, to some great heights in March Madness. I do believe that. And that can always be a little bit worrisome. That I think that Grant Clark backcourt's pretty good for Duquesne. But I feel like BYU's got the better personnel in this match. I'm, I'm very excited to see what Dallin Hall does in this game. It's a big opportunity for him to, to really elevate his profile and become maybe a little bit of a star. I don't know if he's going to hit that level in March Madness, but he, he's got that ability if he has a huge game. Ali Khalifa, to me, is the guy that could become a huge storyline coming out of an NCAA tournament game. Mark Pope said to BYU TV that he expects his full roster on Thursday. You wonder, though, how many minutes can Khalifa go? Because that ankle, that right ankle, was pretty swollen coming out of that Texas Tech game, and he acknowledged that it was painful. So, yes, he's going to play, but how many minutes can he play? How, how healthy is he? Is it you know 80%, 90%, 95%? How close to 100% is he? No, no one's perfect at this late stage of the season, but still, you wonder how many minutes he can play. And I think you need at least 15 from Ali Khalifa, at least. Ideally, 20. Uh, and then you have that split down the middle between him and Foose because BYU's offense, to me, the essence, the, the identity of what BYU's offense is at its best is when Ali Khalifa is on the floor. I love Foose. He's the ultimate enforcer in the post, and I don't imagine Mahorichich is going to be able to, to contain Foose. I, I don't. Foos is so strong. He's been he's taken such huge leaps this season in his game. It's been a joy to watch. But again, that five out look that Khalifa brings to the floor is very difficult. And I'm fascinated to see how Duquesne, who prides itself on the defensive end, matches up against that. I mean, you look at the the outputs that Duquesne opponents score, it's not high numbers. Teams are not putting up many points on Duquesne, even in their losses for Duquesne. The highest point total allowed was back on November 22nd against Nebraska, who's an NCAA tournament team. The Cornhuskers, of course, are an eight seed uh, in, in the bracket this year. Uh, they gave up 81 to Santa Clara. Solid team. We, we, we all know that with the, the WCC days. They gave up 80 to UMass. Uh, but outside of that, I mean, it's... It's 75 and less, and that might just be a byproduct of, again, the A-10 style, but they don't give up much, and so I'm curious to see how BYU's offense fares against this group, but I, I think BYU will come out on top. I do. Uh, you know, I know Duquesne's got the storyline of their head coach, Keith Dambrod, who's in his final season. He announced before the NCAA tournament this is this is going to be his final go. He's going to retire after the tournament run, which... To me, is kind of strange. Why announce that before the tournament? Uh, maybe it just creates the players to be more inspired. Is that the thought? I don't know. But it, it makes for a good storyline. That's for sure for, for Duquesne. The Dukes from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, if you're not aware of Duquesne. That's where they're located. Uh, the last time they played in the NCAA tournament was 1977. Norm Nixon former Laker star, he was their guard at Duquesne back in 1977 when they reached the NCAA tournament. So it's been a long time for the Dukes since they've been in this spot. And it's interesting, too, with Duquesne, you kind of wonder if the committee just said, enough's enough, we're tired of scrubbing this bracket, 
just place the A-10 champs who won on the Sunday into that 11 seed. Because Duquesne, they had a little bit of restrictions being placed in the bracket too because one of the host sites, Pittsburgh, is hosted by them, Duquesne. So they could not play there. And you just wonder if they were said enough's enough, just give them the 11 seed and we'll call it good because they don't have the profile, the resume that warrants an 11 seed. And that's been well documented this week as, you know, teams like New Mexico who are, you know, some metrics, top 25, top 30, they're getting an 11 seed. And then Duquesne, who's around 80 in some advanced predictive met- metrics, they're getting an 11 seed as well. So I think BYU got a favorable matchup and it sets up a potential round of 32 matchup against Illinois or Moorhead State. We'll see how it plays out. I did see Illinois here in Omaha near the uh, Chai Health Center. They were at the Marriott in downtown Omaha, right by the arena. The Big Ten Tournament champions have first-team Big Ten player Terrence Shannon, uh, Marcus Domasic and Coleman Hawkins, so all Big Ten players for Illinois. And then Moorhead State, I'm kind of curious to see how they play against Illinois. I know Illinois is a, they're pretty dang good offensively, but, you know, Illinois hasn't done anything in the NCAA tournament in years. BYU has a more recent Sweet 16 appearance in the Big Dance than Illinois. The last time Illinois reached the second weekend, Darren Williams and D. Brown we're playing for the Fighting Illini. That was in 2005. So this tournament has always created some letdowns and failures for Illinois. A couple years ago, they had one of the best teams in the country with that big man. I I, I forget his name, uh, but they had an early exit. I think that was in the Indianapolis NCAA tournament. So Illinois has been kind of a program that's choked quite a bit. And you wonder if BYU could... You know, if they can get to that round of 32 and play them, just play loose. House money. No one's going to predict you to to win that game. Just play loose and see if you can get to the, to the regional semifinals and play in the Sweet 16. Moorhead State's interesting, as I noted. They have the Ohio Valley Conference Player of the Year, Riley Minix. He's an NAIA transfer, and he's just tearing it up for Moorhead State. And I don't know, you know, I'm not going to, I would not pick Moorhead State, but man, it would be interesting if they could just give them a scare. Make them work for 40 minutes. If BYU gets by Duquesne, takes care of business in the morning spot, then we're all watching Illinois, Moorhead State. Just make them work for 40 minutes and take them to the brink to see what they could do. And, you know, I, I, whenever I think of Moorhead State, I think of that team. Gosh, with Kenneth Fareed in the NCAA tournament, they got to the round of 32 once upon a time. I think that was Jimmer's senior year in 2011. So we'll see what Moorhead State can do against Illinois. But I think BYU gets the round of 32. That's where I see them falling to Illinois. But, hey, if BYU plays at its best, and when I say at its best, that second half against Kansas – the second half against TCU, that first half against UCF. BYU can go toe-to-toe with anyone. You play the way you did against Iowa State back in January. You can get to the Elite Eight and play UConn for a chance to go to the Final Four. That's in the cards for BYU. That's, I think, the ceiling for this group if they play their best. And consistently playing at that high level at times has been a challenge for this BYU team. But if that three-point shot has fallen, man, BYU can get rolling in a big way and get get to a a far distance in this NCAA tournament. So we'll see how it all plays out. Thursday it begins for the Cougars. We'll have coverage here on KSL Sports throughout the week. I am excited because for me personally, this is my first true – NCAA tournament experience as a media member. The first NCAA tournament that I covered was the COVID year in 2021. I was in Indianapolis for that one, but it was strange because it was the bubble and you couldn't really interact with the team and all the press conferences were on Zoom and it was just, it was awkward. It wasn't, you know, a typical NCAA tournament. 
So this is my first real chance to cover a big dance, and I'm excited about that. I mean, I got onto the beat around the 2015 season. So that was the, the first year I was there was the first four against Ole Miss, and BYU blew that lead in the second half against the Rebels in Dayton. And then after that, I mean, it's only been, this is the second NCAA tournament bid for the Cougars since then. They would have been in 2020, but obviously COVID took away the big dance this year. So uh, it's uh, it'll be a lot of fun. I can't wait. I'm, I'm excited to experience it. I'm curious to see if any Cougar fans make a trip to Omaha. I got to imagine there's, there's some BYU fans here in the Midwest that are going to be pouncing on these tickets. They're going to be in the crowd, making their presence felt. So it's going to be a lot of fun. I can't wait. Going to have all the coverage this week on kslsports.com, KSL News Radio, KSL 5 TV, and the KSL Sports Zone. So I'll catch you next time here on the Cougar Tracks podcast, and it's powered by kslsports.com.